it's always been a pleasure, you know, to be uh, in the one of the uh, Korea Foundation's activities. Uh, but before we begin to the uh, into the sessions, I would like to respond to the questions that I think any questions deserve answer, right? So for me, it's better to be a friend of minister rather than being minister. <laughs> so that way, you know, uh, I don't have to work very hard like uh, all the minister, but you know, still, you know, contribute, you know, my thought, ideas, and how uh, 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 issues, you know, should be resolved. But anyway, uh, in these sessions, uh, we will talk more on uh, uh, at least three cases and also the visions, you know, of the uh, middle powers uh, uh, on how, you know, uh, these ideas of, you know, public diplomacy, middle powers uh, uh, role, uh, you know, is put, you know, into, you know, into practice. And we quite fortunate to have uh, uh, three uh, uh, very experienced, you know, speakers uh, and experts in their own uh, field, you know, in terms of, you know, practice. Uh, because I think we already have a debate about the, you know, theoretical debate about the middle powers and public diplomacy this morning. So in this session, you know, we hope that we can gain more uh, insights in how uh, public diplomacy is put, you know, into practice. And then, of course, it will also contribute at the end, you know, to the conceptualizations of the concept of middle powers uh, uh, itself. Uh, we also have two commentators, you know, I hope uh, uh, we will, uh, the two commentators will follow uh, the uh, example set by uh, Professor Philip Seep this morning, you know, asking very, you know, controversial or provocative uh, questions so that we can have uh, a more lively uh, discussion. Because the, great, the, the most difficult job for this session, especially for the speakers, is not actually presenting your thought about, you know, public diplomacy, but actually how to keep me and others awake, you know, after a, a nice lunch that we just had. So that's, I think, is a far more difficult uh, rather than, you know, just presenting the uh, cases uh, that you are already uh, prepared, uh, you know, to do. So the first speaker will be uh, Mr. Finn Anderson. Uh, he's been introduced actually by Mr. Kim uh, this uh, morning. Uh, but uh, uh, let me also highlight a number of uh, uh, aspects of his uh, career. Uh, you know, he's been the general, uh, Secretary General of the Dennis Cultural Institutes you know, uh, uh, in Copenhagen since 1997. That uh, 15 or no, 16 years. Uh, already, and, 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 and he was also country director of the uh, DCI, the Dennis Cultural Institute in Britain and Ireland, uh, based in Edinburgh, you know, from 1985 to 1997. Uh, he holds an MA, MA in English uh, Philology and Literature, I think I'm getting old, I can't read, uh, and cultural, <laughs> oh my glass is, you know, having a problem, uh, cultural studies at Ar Ar Arhus University and MSc in the Cultural Management and Cultural you know, policy uh, from the Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. And, 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 and in 2000, he was awarded an honorary doctor of letters degree from Edinburgh Napier University. And this is very important, I think he is a knight of uh, Dannenbrook. Is that correct spelling or uh, pronunciation? Yeah. Yeah. So he's a knight. So we should call you sir? No. Oh, no. <laughs> well, the second, uh, 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 Mr. Anderson will, will, will speak uh, on the uh, role of the EU, especially the unique, right? Uh, 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 you know, especially you know in in, in cultural uh, 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 arena. The second speaker, uh, Mr. Paul Hatos, uh, he is the general director, you know, for the Hungarian Balasi Institute. Uh, uh, he graduated from the Edfos Loran University in Budapest uh, in history and also holds an MA in literature and law. You know, he has a PhD in history. Uh, he has been twice visiting professor and also the holder of Hungarian uh, Studies Chair at the Indiana University, uh, Bloomington. Uh, he has published widely on European and uh, Hungarian intellectual history uh, of the 19th and 20th century. And Mr. Uh, Hatos has, has worked as a legal advisor you know, at Ministry of Justice of the Republic of Hungary and also as a cabinet head of the departments of the Ministry of Education. Uh, he will actually share his uh, uh, views and experience with regard to the Hungary uh, 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 role or quest, you know, for I think nation, national branding, you know, and, and so on. Uh, I'm sure that we can learn a lot from the Hungarians' experience. The uh, third speaker is uh, my ASEAN colleague, uh, Jean Tan. You know, she has been the uh, executive director of this uh, very famous, at least, you know, in Asia Pacific, I think we all know the SIF, the Singapore uh, International Foundations. Uh, uh, and, and prior joining to the SIF, uh, she was the press secretary, you know, to Manpower Minister, and the Ministry's Director of Communications. So that's, I think, experience is also very useful for us if you know uh, we listen to her later on, you know, because as a Director of Communication, I think she's very good in trying to communicate, you know, whatever experience that she has before. Uh, 
uh, her earlier posts included also uh, some posts in the Ministry of Information and the Arts and Singapore Film Commission, and also as a diplomat, you know, in Washington uh, D.C. He is a graduate. Uh, she is a graduate of the NUS, uh, and she was awarded the Singapore Government Merit Scholarship to pursue further studies in the U.S. and also holds postgraduate qualification in linguistics. Uh, Jean volunteers as board vice chairman uh, with the International Forum on Development Service. It's also in Singapore, yeah, Jean. Uh, then we have two commentators. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor uh, Ethan Gilbois. I don't think that I need a lengthy introduction. So we already uh, know him uh, from these uh, morning sessions. Uh, but he's a, a world-renowned expert on international communications and public diplomacy. And in fact, you know, if you search the, the Googles, you know, trying to find you know how to connect middle power and public diplomacy, you keep coming up. You know, his name keep coming up. You know, so in fact, you know, I myself also learned you know a lot from a number of his papers that uh, he already uh, 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 published and, and written uh, on this uh, middle powers and public diplomacy. And in fact, Professor Gilboa, one of very few scholars, you know, who really, I think, quite uh, consistently focus on, you know, the importance of public diplomacy uh, for uh, middle powers, because this is, I think, uh, one of the strongest, you know, uh, 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 point for middle powers if they want to succeed, you know, in advocating or promoting a certain, you know, uh, issues at the global you know, arena. The final, the last uh, speaker or commentator is uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Yul Son, uh, and uh, he is a dean and professor at the Graduate School of International Studies at Yonsei University. He has a lot of uh, 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 past experience, but uh, let me read a couple of, you know, I think it's very important publications that he commissions in the past, you know, especially in, ter uh, in the area of soft power. Uh, he wrote uh, also a, a paper on the attracting the neighbors about the soft power competition in East Asia. This is one of very rare, I think, you know, uh, studies on the competition using soft power because, you know, when we talk about Asia Pacific, basically we always talk about the strategic you know, competitions among the major powers. And he also uh, published uh, uh, Securitizing Trade, the case of US and Korea, Free Trade Arrangement, and uh, Japan's New Regionalism, uh, uh, China Threat, Universal Values, and the East Asia Community. Uh, Professor Sons received his PhD you know, in political science from the University of Chicago, uh, Illinois, uh, in the US. Uh, since we have only three speakers, not like four or five this morning, so I will allow probably to uh, each speaker to speak to uh, 12 to 15 minutes, and but after that I will, you know, of course, sound my alarm bell, you know, the glass. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and, and for the commentators, uh, I hope that you can uh, offer your you know, criticism <laughs> or questions, you know, to the three presenters within uh, 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 10 minutes. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Anderson first. I think in uh, international conference language, this is known as the horror slot just after lunch, so my apologies to my successors if I manage to put you all asleep within the next 10 minutes. Anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to thank the Korea Foundation for inviting me to give this, uh, to participate and give this presentation. I'm going to pick up on two uh, words that were mentioned briefly this morning, namely culture and networking or multilateralism. And uh, I'm going to exemplify it by uh, talking about a European cultural organization called UNIQ, and also the new uh, European External Action Service a little bit. So we'll see how it goes. Anyway, uh, <coughs> when we talk about uh, European culture, uh, I'm sure most of you will not think about it as a common uh, expression, but of individual countries, Italian culture, uh, German, Danish, whatever. And uh, this is, of course, fine, uh, because this is one of the assets of European culture, uh, its diversity, that it's all very different. But uh, it also causes a problem sometimes. I think it was Kissinger who once said, if you want to call Europe, where, which number do you dial? And it's a little bit the same with, with culture. Uh, uh, it's a very diversified thing, and it could do with a bit more of cultural cooperation. But culture, of course, is the uh, prerogative of each uh, country's uh, minister of culture. And up until now, it's been sort of guarded very jealously by them. Uh, I still wonder why, because 
Uh, we're not trying to harmonize uh, European culture, but many of us would like to see some more uh, cultural cooperation. And this is what uh, this network, uh, UNIC, uh, is uh, all about. Culture is very important. It's not just uh, in diplomacy. It's not just the trade figures, the political discussions, the security and so on. But culture can be a generator and expression of ideas and knowledge. And it can be entertainment, uh, development and so on. Um, so it plays a very important role. It can also be the, uh, uh, it can both be a solution to conflicts as well as the generator of uh, conflicts, as it were. Uh, so uh, it's a very important uh, issue in the whole debate about uh, possible clashes of civilizations. Uh, UNIC means the EU National Institutes of Culture. And it's an organization of uh, European National Cultural Institutes, which was formed in 2006, myself being one of the uh, founding fathers uh, of it. <coughs> and uh, it was established as an organization to promote, first of all, professional exchange of knowledge and cooperation. It's a pool of expertise and uh, competence uh, between all these uh, organizations. And there are 32 of them altogether uh, from 26 uh, countries. And they, I don't know whether it's a middle power or even bigger, but uh, we have 2,000 uh, institutes when we pool them all together. And they are now uh, represented uh, in cooperation in over 90 uh, branches around the world and in as many countries. Uh, about 25,000 people are employed, if you put them all together. And in financial terms, uh, we have a joint uh, 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 budget of two and a half billion uh, euros. I'm afraid the Danish one is a very small contribution to this, unfortunately. But this is part of the idea because uh, this middle power is actually a great advantage to smaller countries that can participate in a uh, bigger project together with the bigger boys in the class like the British Council, the uh, Goethe Institute, uh, French Institute and so on and so forth. Um, the area within culture uh, we operate in is, is very broad. It's anything from uh, language courses to um, arts projects uh, across the board. Uh, education, science, uh, cultural development, conflicts, resolution, and so on and so forth. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we joined together in local clusters. I know there's one here in, uh, in uh, Seoul also. I've talked to one of the members at least, uh, and maybe we'll talk more. But uh, it's an organization that's still growing uh, almost by the day uh, because more and more cultural institutes see the advantages of uh, cooperating. So uh, we don't have uh, a common European uh, harmonized culture, but we do talk about European values. And that is one of the important things that we're trying to promote. And what are these values? Yes, they are, for example, democracy. They are uh, ruled by uh, legality. They are human rights. They are freedom of speech, freedom of artistic expression, and so on. So these are some uh, common values that uh, we are trying to promote, both inside, but certainly uh, even more outside Europe. And that's a sort of uh, communality. We also have a, a, a growing uh, issue about uh, European identity um, and growing uh, with the growing uh, skepticism within Europe about the European project. Uh, young people seem to have forgotten why the EU was established, namely as a peace project, mainly after the Second World War. And uh, I think this is as crucial and important today as it was uh, then. So uh, we're trying to expand the role of culture in Europe, and we're trying to uh, expand the role of European culture uh, in third uh, countries.
we think because of the size of, of this organization, um, it is becoming a very vital power in promoting this. Uh, we cooperate uh, very closely with uh, the EU Commission, uh, uh, t trying to put fesh, flesh and blood on uh, the various programs that are being uh, developed in the European Commission, uh, apart from the programs uh, we develop ourselves. So, uh, one of the important areas, of course, for European culture is the creative uh, industries uh, or cre cultural industries, the creative economies. So that's another aspect of culture and cultural importance, that is the economic uh, as aspect of it. Uh, here you can see where the clusters are uh, worldwide and a long list of them briefly. So the general aim of uh, some of our strategic uh, flagship projects is, of course, to uh, develop uh, and promote uh, and strengthen existing uh, cultural relations we have on a bilateral uh, level. And uh, one of the strategic uh, themes we've had since the beginning has been to develop relationships with um, the so-called BRIC countries, starting uh, with China. And we have now, uh, for more than six years, had annual conferences uh, between uh, UNIC and the Chinese National Academy for the Arts. The last one was in Xi'an, the fifth, uh, here in uh, October, uh, focusing very much on uh, urban culture and cultural heritage. Uh, this has been a very uh, long uh, journey, uh, which uh, started with two very separate uh, cultures uh, meeting and, and two very different uh, conference uh, uh, cultures, uh, because uh, to begin with, uh, the Chinese uh, experts came with very prepared statements. We also had prepared statements from the European side, but we were very interested in developing a dialogue uh, form with the Chinese. And I must say, it's been very uh, useful uh, to have this process because the two parties have come much closer together. And we now involve uh, artistic uh, elements uh, like artistic workshops for Chinese and European artists, uh, so-called co-creation where they're trying to work together to produce uh, artistic works that will be completely different from uh, what both sides had done before. So that's been very useful. Uh, I'm presenting here in this picture uh, a very important uh, publication, uh, a, Euro uh, a cultural compass to understanding uh, Chinese culture. And there's a Chinese version about understanding European culture. The subtitle of the publication is, do we always mean the same when, when we say the same? I mean, same words uh, seemingly have very different uh, meanings. Uh, just take the word democracy. So uh, to have a beneficial uh, dialogue, it's very important to have the right language, the right vocabulary. Another flagship project which is under, uh, under, uh, in, in the process is a MENA project, uh, uh, the North African and Middle Eastern uh, countries, um, where in, in the wake of the uh, Arab uh, Spring, uh, the uh, effort to uh, make democratic transformation uh, is something we are trying to uh, promote uh, very much. Um, so uh, these are sort of two of the major flagship projects that involve a lot of the Institute. But otherwise, the local clusters, of course, will have many, many, many uh, different uh, types of projects, uh, anything from literature, literary uh, nights to uh, joint exhibitions and concerts and so on and so forth. Uh, I've given a few uh, website uh, uh, references if, in case you wanted to uh, read a bit more about it. Now, one of the important uh, issues for us is to promote the cooperation with the EU uh, Commission and Parliament. 
and in particular in relation to the new uh, project, uh, the European uh, External Action Service, where uh, culture is not actually uh, figuring in the uh, original uh, statement of this, but we're trying together with the uh, ambassadors for the EU to promote uh, culture uh, more and more at a European level uh, around the world. And uh, fortunately, the EU ambassadors seem to be very interested in, in culture and understand this as a very important uh, uh, diplomatic uh, tool uh, in their efforts. So um, the UNIC organization is very active in trying to help the European Commission to achieve the goals of the um, uh, Euro external European Action Service. So we see there a paradigm shift uh, in diplomacy towards the multilateral uh, cooperation, which several of this morning's speakers also mentioned. Uh, and I think this is a, a very, very positive thing because it means that you have <coughs> joint uh, programs and it's an inclusive uh, program also that uh, includes uh, not just middle powers but also very tiny uh, powers uh, like Denmark. And uh, I've listed here a number of the issues that will be dealt with in, in this uh, paradigm uh, shift. Uh, just to finish off, a couple of other major uh, programs from UNIC is uh, a series of conferences around Europe and now also outside Europe uh, called More Europe, uh, as opposed to Less Europe, as uh, some people and some countries like Britain seems to think at the moment is good. Uh, we're trying to uh, involve uh, the general public as well as experts in a discussion uh, reminding all of us of the importance of European uh, cooperation, including cultural cooperation. Uh, a second major uh, project is uh, a mapping uh, action, uh, culture in EU's external relations, where I think 36 countries are being uh, examined with regard to their uh, European and cultural policies. And it's a, it's a major project underway that will result in a huge document sometime next year. So these are some examples of the work of UNIC uh, in the area I would call cultural uh, diplomacy. And uh, I would hope and also think that this is an area which is of uh, growing recognition as an important part of uh, public uh, uh, diplomacy. So I think, have I? One more minute. <laughs> well, shall I dance or shall I? <laughs> no, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Anderson. Please join me. Thanks. <laughs> well, actually, I, I remember I did bring. Oh, where does it disappear to? I did bring one uh, overview. Uh, can I have my PowerPoint back? <laughs> now the minute is lapsing. Is it coming? Okay. This was just by way of an afterthought to give you a sort of quick overview of the difference between traditional diplomacy and uh, public diplomacy. And uh, I would call many of the areas on the right, it also applies to uh, exactly cultural diplomacy. It's a people-to-people -people thing. It's about making your cultural attraction attractive. It's about uh, citizenships and mutual benefits partnerships, uh, shaping pre preferences, and so on. And uh, it's a win-win situation instead of a win-lose situation. That was my final comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will not summarize the presentations. This actually is there in, in, in the book as well. So 
Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Paul Hatos. So now it's my turn first to thank of all my heart the warm invitation of the Korean Foundation. It seems to me that Hungary, or myself, is the old one out uh, in this room now as uh, faculty. Uh, but uh, of course, I think back that Korea is loved and liked in Hungary. And the most populous and most popular Hungarian studies center works not elsewhere, but in Seoul. So thank you very much. And I would like to uh, begin with, with this title, Sisyphean Task, the chase for the good name of the nation. So my presentation is uh, rather uh, focusing on the underflows, the cultural underflows of what we call soft power or middle power policy or public diplomacy. Sisyphus, as you may know, was a mythological king in the Greek mythology who was punished by the gods. We will all be punished one day uh, as to roll up a huge boulder on a steep hill uh, just only to see uh, this uh, boulder bouncing back uh, all the time and having no uh, way out from this uh, burden. But of course there are interpretations. It can interp uh, we can interpret Sisyphus, the myth of Sisyphus, as the absurdity of human existence. But also that through this absurdity, through this, uh, this uh, burden, we have uh, always uh, the task and always the force to recommence. And as for Hungary, it's, uh, it's a task because we live in a culture of defeat uh, for centuries and we will live for a while in a state uh, where a middle power or a power status is more than a dream, than an ambition. So let me begin with a German moment to, to say that the cultural diplomacy, according to my opinion, has a root in the Enlightenment and the concept of the Weltliteratur of uh, Johann Wolfgang Goethe made a lot of this. And which is more interesting for our case that he successfully linked a universal concept to a national goal. And if we read, I nevertheless would personally like to make my friends aware that I'm convinced a universal world literature is in the process. That's the first statement of Goethe. And the second, that an honorable role is reserved for us Germans. And you see in the image Napoleon, the famous French emperor, meeting with Goethe after the Battle of Jena, which was lost to the Germans, but won for the German literature and image building because the emperor met uh, Johann Wolfgang Goethe, who was not just a successful and world-renowned poet, but also a minister for uh, the Weimar, Weimar Grand Duchy. The French moment is also a universal link to the national. Uh, liberty leading the people, Delacroix's immortal painting powerfully demonstrates a certain idea of France, as General de Gaulle put it in the 1960s. And again, an example how the so-called big nations promote their image on the back of different universal ideas. And again, the American century, Gone with the Wind, the famous, uh, famous romance uh, of the Civil War, Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley in this poster with a huge car uh, representing the American dream, so attractive for many millions of people. But of course, this is also something national, linking big capitalism of the North with the sentimental provincialism of the South and successfully sold to the entire world. Uh, now, let's try to uh, capture some 
current in today's culture, it's a bit pessimistic, uh, and I try to emphasize the uh, ambiguity of underlying currents uh, behind many, many things. So our culture is visual culture. Contemporary culture comes to be more and more visual instead of verbal. Culture works more and more as business. So sometimes it's hardly discernible of the entertainment industry. As Finn Anderson uh, spoke about, uh, talked about uh, culture industries instead of culture. So this is something which is industrial, which is serial. And of course, globalization means that the room for national cultural policies has been significantly reduced. Is it good or is it bad? That's the fact. And of course, the democratization of the creative energies is a very good sign that there is an access to creative activities, Instagram and everything else. But it means also the decline of excellence in some way that everyone knows everything uh, more and more, at least they think or we think that we are more and more knowledgeable to more and more things which were close to us before. And of course, uh, there is a crossover identities. Again, one thing which is good but at the same time, the blurring of identity gave people some kind of uh, uncertainty. Trends in culture sponsorship is also something no 30. Of course, culture has strong marketing potential today, but there is a decreasing institutional financing we all witness, uh, at least in Europe, and project-based sponsorship has growing importance. And with that comes uh, some kind of occasional or accidental uh, instead of uh, planning into the future. And of course, uh, business is business. So companies donate to build or reinforce their own image or, uh, and the attractiveness of the place they operate instead of uh, focusing to, to the cultural activity. And of course, companies target audiences more than support creative activity, uh, which can be also damaging sometimes. And now I uh, go to the Hungarian case, uh, Hungarian image making, past and present. Hungarian cultural diplomacy, as I mentioned, uh, is uh, born out of the defeat, uh, World War I trauma of defeat and dismemberment of a historical or so-called historical greatness of Hungary. And of course, uh, its aim was to correct or to, to, to heal the wounds uh, that uh, to, to make a better understanding of what is Hungary in the West and to set up a well-prepared Western-minded new elite who could refurbish the image of Hungary. So that was that. But if we look at to other Central and Eastern European countries, we find out that Hungarian image building efforts display the characteristics of the reputation management of other countries, namely that opposed to big nations which can, which could afford to promote their image, not directly, but on the back of different universal ideas, small countries rarely can take advantage of such mediums. And now, some image of Hungary. Of course, uh, that's what in all touristic posters you have. Uh, and of course, when I was hitchhiking in, in the uh, United States, uh, I always said that I'm uh, riding on horse when I'm back at home to get a better result and reach a, a, a better distance. But of course, this is a projection. Projection of virile bravery of the Hungarian Chikos, the horseman, and of course, there is 
a hidden counterpart, uh, the image of the Hungarian Pusta in a painting, which is a famous painting for Hungarians, but of course we don't publicize it for abroad. Uh, the Set Hungarian Destiny, it's the title of this uh, painting, which is also uh, symbolizing a horse uh, in the middle of nowhere, the Hungarian Pusta. So you can find out, and this is my point to you here, is that all publicity of a country or an idea or creativity has two faces. And that is always the projection and the hidden or latent unconscious. And of course, uh, for me, there is the public diplomacy of those who can do that. And this is uh, Donny Gyurta, who in the 2012 London Olympic uh, Games was the champion for the 200 meter breaststroke. But he offered a replica of his Olympic medal to the parents of his former competitor, a Norwegian who suddenly died just months before uh, the game started and uh, Dani Gyurta was now uh, in a position to win. And when the national anthem was played, he was just pointing above to the sky and won uh, many thousands uh, of hearts in Norway. Whether this is a national branding, uh, more efficient than the previous one, I think the, uh, the response is affirmative. Of course, what does the Hungarian cultural diplomacy do? The Balashi Institute, Balashi is a poet like Goethe or Cervantes or Camões, so we are a poetic nation. Uh, but uh, we promote, support Hungary's cultural heritage. It's very important cultural heritage, also then uh, progressivity, the creative. We encourage international cooperation in culture and science and the furthering of the Hungarian language education. And you see uh, the short history of uh, what we do uh, and uh, just a short survey that we have now 20 cultural institutes. Last week I uh, opened the Beijing Hungarian Institute and there will be two, three more uh, just in the near future. So, uh, and in the numbers, it's not to praise ourselves, but just to compare that even uh, for a country of 10 million, it's big that we can have uh, 1.6 million visitors to our, our events worldwide when we count always uh, just uh, 10 million people. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for, again for the invitation and for the lively debates. And I hope that uh, we, can, uh, we can further discuss matters which are also related to Hungarians' cultural defeat or a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hatos. Now, Jim. They're all very tall. I wish to express my appreciation to the Korean Foundation. I think it's a um, demonstration of brilliant leadership uh, in convening this gathering so that we have a good mix of uh, academics and practitioners like myself. And we're able to converse and um, to collaborate. So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all still awake. Um, I'm happy to be here to share with you um, a practitioner's perspective on public diplomacy um, the Singapore International Foundation, or SIF, which is where I work, um, our model of public diplomacy is one that harnesses the power of friendship that's fostered between Singaporeans and world communities through the programs that we organize and with the objective of enriching lives and effecting positive change. Now, most of the existing literature on Singapore's foreign policy uh, has concentrated on the study of hard power or um, in the economic sphere. As such, the study of soft power in Singapore's foreign policy 
has generally not received much attention. So what I will share with you today is my understanding of Singapore's efforts in public diplomacy, as well as the efforts of non-state actors like the SIF in creating greater understanding between communities and strengthening ties at the people-to-people -people level. Now, efforts to explain policies and actions and to influence publics as opposed to uh, foreign governments are hardly new in international relations. Public diplomacy is the term applied to this practice. Today, public diplomacy is increasingly seen as a critical tool for developing what Joseph Nye calls soft power, the ability to co-opt others through the attractiveness of one's institutions, ideas, values, cultures, and the perceived legitimacy of policies. In today's world, I would say, one that's threatened by terrorism and civil strife, uh, some would say that the real solution lies in interfaith or intercultural dialogues. In other words, to use soft power, not weapons, to persuade and influence opinion, both abroad and domestically. The power of the global information age, the compression of time and space with new communication technologies and social media, has also created a new environment in the international system to win hearts and minds of people, or to export ideas and influence public opinion. I'm sure many of us have also grappled with how our organizations will morph uh, with social media and new technologies. With increased global interdependence, multilateral diplomacy too has gained importance. Today, a country's foreign policy agenda is also shaped by international institutions and norms, the media, and civil society. So we have real solutions being interfaith, intercultural dialogues, we have new tools to play with, and we have global interdependence. So given this growing importance of public diplomacy in its various forms, such as cultural diplomacy, I would say that the key purpose to engage publics who are relevant to the foreign policy purposes of the state is the purpose of public diplomacy. In this case, one would expect public diplomacy to have been the default purview of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Singapore, but this does not appear to be the case. Thus, the involvement of non-state actors, the NGOs, think tanks, youth, businesses, opinion leaders, um, and NGOs like the SIF. Compared to um, China, Japan, Korea,